Good morning and welcome to our worship service. It's so good to have you with us. As we begin this morning, just some little updates. Uh, Marianne Trockley has had uh, some tests this week and they turned out very, very good. So we're very thankful for that. I want to praise the Lord for that. Uh, Peter Hall uh, had a procedure at the general and we want to pray for him. Um, he's doing fine and we uh, just want to remember him. Uh, our little grandson, Luke, um, still in the hospital and still struggling as a preemie with some some issues. One is, and without getting into all the details and an elongated story, one is dealing with his feeding. Uh, they've had to adjust and uh, wrangle with that a whole bunch to maintain his weight, to get his weight up. Uh, I guess that's a quite a common problem with preemies, and it's been a real problem with him. And the other one is a, a development of his skull and that it would separate properly. And they're concerned about it. And that would be a, a major problem that would have to be dealt with at Mac McMaster um, and would have to be dealt with surgically. So um, lots to pray about. It is a stressful time for us as a family. So I'm just praying that uh, things would... Uh, obviously go very well and God would really have his hand in this situation. And thank you folks for all your prayer support. We really appreciate it. Please keep praying. Uh, I will be preaching on the book of Philippians. So just a little heads up. If you want to start reading the book of Philippians, please do that. Uh, I haven't preached on a book per se uh, in a while, and I'd like to do that. Um, it's a small letter, a small epistle, but a very practical one, and I think would apply to us uh, during this pandemic very much so. So anyway, um, if you want to read up on that, please do so. It is the book of Philippians. Let's open in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for uh, the good news from Marianne that things went well, and we pray for Pete that the procedure uh, that he is having done will work effectively. You just have your hand upon him. And we pray for little Luke. Father, you just bless that little guy. Uh, he's fighting so hard. And, and be with Amy and Graham and be with us as a family. Uh, Father, bring good news and encourage us. And Father, have your healing hand upon that little guy and just touch him as only you can. So we thank you for this day that you've given us a chance to worship you. And as we do that, I just pray that as we focus again on the blessed hope that we have in Christ's return, Father, you just encourage our hearts. For we ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. Well, we're back in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians, but um, not so much we're focusing on that this morning, but we're actually going to focus on the remaining points I wanted to get those done and then get into some questions. I'm going to have to leave the questions till next week so we can end it with that, uh, answering some some questions that people might have about the rapture and uh, maybe the tribulation period and that type of thing. But I'm reading from J.B. Phillips. I love J.B. Phillips, the old Anglican uh, scholar that uh, from days gone by and his uh, his rendering of the New Testament. Now, we don't want you, my brothers, to be in any doubt about those who fall asleep in death or to grieve over them like men who have no hope. After all, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again from, the, from death, then we can believe that God will just as surely bring with Jesus all who are asleep in him. Here we have a, a definite message from the Lord. It is that those who are still living when he comes will not in any way precede those who have previously fallen asleep. One word of a command, one shout from the archangel, one blast from the trumpet of God, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died in Christ will be the first to rise, and then we who are still living on the earth will be swept up with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And after that, we shall be with him forever. God has given me this message on that, the matter so that by all means, use it to encourage 
one another. And that's what we want to do. Use it to encourage one another. Amen. I found this poem the other day, and I thought it would be uh, something good to open with. It, it shows us, for one thing, that we all have challenges. This, this prominent health and wealth and prosperity gospel that's so prominent over the TV is a false gospel. It is a false gospel. Life is not a walk in the park. But our blessed hope, the rapture, brings us comfort on our good days and our not-so-good days. Because God's promise is that Jesus will come for us. He loves us and will take us unto himself when that great event occurs. A rural housewife who lived uh, uh, at least one generation ago wrote these lines on day-to-day -day comfort of the rapture, even when days are stacked with everyday problems that we all experience. Listen to her words from her life. I thought, I thought they were quite appropriate. Sometimes when everything goes wrong, when days are short and nights are long, when the wash day brings so dull a sky, not a single thing will dry. And when the kitchen chimney smokes, and when there's none so old as folks, when friends deplore my faded youth, and when the baby cuts a tooth, while John, while John the baby, last but one, clings round my skirt till day is done, and fat good-natured Jane is glum, and the butcher's man forgot to come. Sometimes I say, on days like these, I get a sudden glimpse or gleam of bliss. Not on some sunny day of ease, he'll come, but on a day like this. Amen. On those challenging days, we have that hope, and he will come. I also want to open up with a story um, about a practical joke that went awry. Uh, Herbert Washington, whom co-workers at Significant Plastics Incorporated say was unduly concerned with the rapture and second coming of Christ, suffered a serious heart attack when those he worked with pretended they'd been caught away without him. They laid work outfits on their chairs and hid in a supply room and when Herbert came back from the restroom, he thought everyone, um, he thought that everyone, the rapture had occurred, that everyone had gone up in the rapture. The janitor pretended to have witnessed uh, a disappearance and ran around the office um, uh, pretending he was in a panic state. Herbert fell to the ground, clutching his heart and screaming, I knew you'd forget me, Jesus. What did I do wrong? He was taken to the local hospital. The employees emerged, sobered from the supply room and gathered up their extra clothes. We didn't mean to scare him to death, said one woman. He's just always talking about it. So today we decided to turn the tables on him. Washington underwent bypass surgery and is recovering well and digging into the Bible like never before. Uh, this, this story was kind of sad. Well, it, it is sad what happened. But it displays a, a, a common phenomenon that I've encountered, and this is long before uh, I was uh, pastoring, is that people just don't know what we have studied. They don't know doctrines like imminency. They don't know about the rapture. This guy should have known if he understood anything, if, if he had been taught and, and believed the right biblical stuff, that this couldn't happen. He, for one thing, he, he's going up. Everybody, everybody, if they've trusted Christ, whether, as I said last week, they're the most spiritual person on the face of the earth or a, a carnal Christian, they're going up. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there's no condemnation for these people and then these people no, everybody. It's inclusive. Because why? Because we're covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ when we trust in him. God no longer sees us. He sees us in the righteousness 
of Jesus Christ. And that is the only way we can have forgiveness and get into heaven is through Christ's righteousness. If I stand at the gates, the pearly gates, and St. Peter says, why should I let you in, Ralph? My answer is, there is no reason you should let me in based on my own merit. It's only based on the righteousness of Christ. And I plead that. And that's what people should understand. Uh, you know, people just don't understand. I've had all kinds of people. I remember uh, being at an event in the church I was attending at the time. And this was a big evangelical church with a lot of well-versed people. And again, they were going over one. It was getting close to that weekend when I came to Hamilton. I told you about and the rapture was supposed to occur and all this. This guy had it figured out, 88 reasons and blah, blah, blah. And the people bought into that. Like, again, they should have known right off the bat as biblically grounded people that that isn't possible because it's not imminency. You can't predict it. It's impossible. It's an imminent event. It could happen at any time. And there's no events that mark the rapture. There are events that mark the return of Christ after the tribulation, but nothing that marks the rapture. People need to get that in their head. I did a series on Revelation a little while ago in my church a few years ago, and, and a group of people were, were there. I was talking to them before the service, and they were all scared. Oh, get off this subject, Pastor. Don't preach on this. Just preach on love or something. And I said, well, what's wrong? Oh, we're scared. We won't go. We won't go up in the rapture that we're not good enough. Well, believe me, nobody's good enough. Again, it's based on our standing in Christ. People need to get these truths. And uh, there are teachers that will on, you'll read books and you'll get it on TV that, that preach a, a righteousness, righteousness rapture. Don't listen to them. It's not correct. It's not true that God will, or that Jesus will only take uh, certain people when they're ready, when they're, quote, spiritually got it together. And, and there'll be all these little raptures that happen throughout the tribulation period, etc. That's not right. It's wrong. It's a false doctrine. So don't listen to that. Um, our blessed hope is our blessed hope, and uh, it applies to everyone. Remember the context of what we're dealing with here. The Christians in Thessalonica were scared. They were finding in, in their, their grief little hope because, again, they had a wrong idea. They thought that their brothers and sisters in Christ that had passed away were going to miss out on this great event that Paul told them on the rapture. And uh, Paul writes to them to assure that the dead in Christ, that they're not going to miss out, will rise first. And then in a twinkling of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye, in a millisecond, they will be transformed. They will get their new resurrected bodies, their eternal bodies, which will be united with their souls. And they will be with the Lord forever. The technical term for this is called the translation of the saints. The translation of the saints, the world's greatest makeover, you might call it, and it will transpire in a millisecond. And a millisecond is 100 milliseconds make up a tenth of a second. So you can understand the quickness of that time. And he says, encourage each other with these words. In other words, hang to these words, hang on to them, and hang on practically in life. I know you're going through some tough times, like beyond the lady in our poem uh, with the butcher not coming and uh, hanging out clothes and the chimney smoking and stuff like that. Just one of those days that everything backfires. But beyond that, the people in Thessalonica were actually going through difficult times and being persecuted. But he says, hang on, hang on. We have this blessed hope. So we want to encourage each other this morning by continuing on with some of the foundational truths as to why the rapture will happen before the tribulation period. There's lots and lots of people that are going to tell you, no, no, we're going through the tribulation. Well, that's not correct. Last week, we looked at eight basic reasons. This morning, we will look at a, another 12 that will finish us up to 20. 
And, and my prayer is that each one of these things, I mean, this is a lot, a gain of cognitive material. And I'm not expecting people, okay, if I give you a test, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, respond with all the material that I've presented over this past while or presented this morning, not at all. Relax, enjoy as you listen. But I hope that there may be some things that encourage you, that, that you, you know, that just speak to you and uh, special things that God has in store for us as a church and individuals. So uh, let's begin. There is one little point, though, that I wanted to bring up. I, th I thought an interesting thing I, I've read this week. Uh, Dr. Bill McRae, president of, of OTS and OBC, and I, I don't know, uh, Bill is not there now, and I'm, I mean, I'm not sure of his status. But he spoke at Acadia. We had um, two sets of lectures per year, the Hayward Lectures and the Simpson Lectures. Hayward Lectures, they, they brought in some big name theologian that talked on some theological subject. And then the Simpson Lectures, again, these were theologians. Uh, McCray is an excellent pastor and a super speaker. And he talked about the family, uh, you know, more practical stuff. But I was reading uh, some of his work on the rapture and he suggests, and, and this is a, a kind of a unique point, a good point that uh, when the Lord returns, um, that there'll be a catastrophic event on earth that will um, kind of disguise the rapture happening. And so people won't realize, uh, unsaved people, that it was God doing something. They'll just think there was a, a naturalistic cause, and that's what caused these people to disappear. I don't know. I thought that's interesting. Again, it's just speculation, but uh, kind of an interesting point. So we ended up with number eight. We want to start with number nine this morning. And we start with a kind of tricky word that we've heard before. Uh, it's called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. It's a big word. And all it means is the art or skill you bring to interpreting the Bible. But it is so important. It is so important. People can say, oh, yeah, I, I believe the word of God. Yeah, I believe the word of God. And then they go to it and they absolutely butcher it, interpreting it. Like, what does that do to honor God and plus to portray the truth? There's many sincere folks that make a mess of interpreting the Bible. Simply what we are aiming for is getting a grasp on what the original author, we've got to think, what did the original author uh, mean when they wrote or communicated? The Bible is to be understood in the normal or customary use of language. In other words, there are many that interpret things in an allegorical sense. They don't take the, the plain or normal use of language. They see something deeper there. So you've got them running off and all kinds of interpretations. And you'll see that over church history, and you'll see that today. Um, we need to understand the context, the grammatical context, the historical context, the cultural context or setting. This is called the historical grammatical approach to Scripture. When you approach the Bible from this approach, and that's the approach that I take, the pre-tribulational rapture makes most sense and is the accurate rendering of Scripture. It's very important. So the way you approach the Bible, these people that have different views and different opinions uh, some of them use a, a, a very responsible hermeneutic, and others simply don't. They just don't. So point number nine is that I believe what I believe, and I teach what I teach based on what I feel is a responsible, accurate, scholarly hermeneutic. And that's so important. And number 10, theology. Theos. Theos, thinking about God. You are a theologian. I am a theologian. We are all theologians. Again, as we think about God, we put different pieces together from across the Bible on a subject of 
say sub subject matter from a variety of places, and this is called systematic theology. In other words, we might be talking about salvation, or we might be talking about sin, or we might be talking about angels, or we might be talking about spiritual gifts, but we take information from the whole counsel of God and apply it to that subject, and that is systematic theology. And that's very important. At the same time, we try and understand things through the writings of a particular author, like the writings of Paul or the writings of John, Johannian theology. My professor of New Testament at Acadia was a Lucan scholar. He specialized in the writings of Luke, which is the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Or a particular book, like we would focus on the book of Psalms and the uniqueness of Psalms and, you know, the history of when it was written in the context and all that stuff and how it should be interpreted as poetry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is what we call biblical theology. So we take both. We take systematic theology and we take biblical theology and through that, we seek to understand our Lord better and to honor him. I believe this is how we approach scripture responsibly and get what we would call the big picture. I mean, you can isolate something, uh, an isolated text, and literally make the Bible say whatever you want. People have done that in, in ridiculous and sad um, situations over over history, uh, even today. And uh, it's not responsible. But when you do that, when you look at things systematically, you look at things biblically, uh, we come to the conclusion uh, that the rapture, I believe, is to be taken in a pre-tribulational understanding that the rapture takes place before, before, um, the uh, period that we call the tribulation. So two words, well, two things, theology and hermeneutics. Very important, very important. Number 11, impact on me personally. What are you talking about? Well, in God's providence, I have been touched by many ministries that hold to a pre-tribulational rapture pastors that have touched me and scholars that I hold in high respect for their skill and application of God's word hold to a pre-tribulational rapture. Such names as James Montgomery Boyce, Erwin Lutzer from a Moody Bible Church and Moody Bible Institute who hold in their statement of faith a pre-tribulational rapture. Charles Ryrie, uh, a great theologian, again, representing a place called Dallas Seminary and representing a Bible knowledge commentary, probably the best two-volume commentary put out on the market. Again, consistently, all these guys holding to a pre-tribulational rapture. Such Bible commentators and teachers as Warren Worsby, John Wolverd, great, great biblical scholar, Richard Mayhew, John MacArthur, Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, the Feenbergs, um, great scholars, uh, my own pastors that I've sat under, who I listen to intently, hold to a pre-trib rapture. There are many that I respect that don't hold to a pre-tribulational pre rapture um, and that I would uh, respect in other ways. But there are also many that hold to a pre-tribulational pre rapture that I would not respect and distance myself from because I think in other areas of important doctrine, they err. So you've got to be careful. Um, there's an old saying, you've got to weigh things. And there's an old saying, it says, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, there's people that I would uh, respect and I agree with, and I learn from, but there's areas that I don't agree. But again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> get, get, get the positive things out. You don't have to agree with everything, 
That doesn't mean you just put them aside because you don't agree with everything. And I remember Dr. Cherry, my good friend at Acadia, what a wise gentleman. He said, don't sell yourself to any system. In other words, don't get so boxed in that you can't think constructively and independently. Um, and I, I'm simply saying that I've been impacted by servants God has put in my way, and they've had an influence on me. And good. That's great. I'm, I'm glad and I'm thankful that that is the direction God has moved me in. So I just want to recognize that as the 11th point, the impact that these people have had on me personally. And point number 12, at the time of the rapture, the saints meet Christ in the air. Well, the second coming, Christ returns very differently when you look in the Bible to meet, uh, to, to actually come to the Mount of Olives to meet the saints on earth. At the time of the rapture, the Mount of Olives is unchanged, but it'll be very different at the second coming. It divides, we see from Zechariah 14, 4 and 5, and a valley is formed to the east of Jerusalem. So there's a supernatural event that occurs at the second coming, not the rapture. So the two are very different. So it's got to be pre-tribulational. It's got to be before the rapture. The Church of Philadelphia, point 13, was promised deliverance from the hour of trial. And that's in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, that is going to come upon the whole world to test those alive on the earth. There is a promise from God that they will be kept, the church will be kept from that hour. And I take that in the normal or plain sense as a promise from God that he's going to keep us, the church of Jesus Christ, from going through the tribulation. It says in Revelation 3.10, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth or whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And 14, this is a vital point. Pre-tribulationalism distinguishes clearly between Israel and the church and their respective programs. Both God's people, but the church was formed in Acts 2 with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to indwell all believers, both Greek and Jew, in one body. The church pre was previously a mystery, but is now made known in the New Testament. God has revealed his word, his redemptive program, progressively. God just doesn't come like a dump truck, back it up and dump everything on us at once. It was pro, uh, revealed progressively. And if you look in the, in the book of Hebrews, the final and most uh, revealing thing in that progression of revelation is whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. So progressively, God has made promises starting way back with the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. And uh, we don't have time. Like, if, again, if I was going to preach on this, we'd go into a lot of detail with the covenants, like the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, um, different covenants. But these promises are unconditional promises made to Israel, not based on their faithfulness, but that means God will fulfill them in this pro process of, of redemption or revelation. So he made these promises to Israel in the Old Testament covenants, and they will start to formulate, take place, be set up in the tribulation period, and will be fulfilled in Christ's millennial reign or his reign here on earth that takes place at the end of the tribulation period. The church will not be in the tribulation, Revelation 6 to 19, because it is whose time? Not the church's time, but Israel's special time, where God will work with them to fulfill his will. As Wolverd states, the great tribulation 
is properly interpreted by pre-tribulationalists as a time of preparation for Israel's restoration. And he quotes Deuteronomy 4, 29 and 30 and Jeremiah 30, 4 to 11. It is not, listen to me, it is not the purpose of the tribulation to prepare the church for, go, for glory. If someone comes along and tells you the church is where the spiritual fulfillment uh, of, of, of the nation of Israel and blah, 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 I don't buy that. It's not true. You've got to fudge a lot of scripture, uh, allegorize a lot of scripture, and uh, you cannot take it at the plain or face value uh, of, of, of language and do a lot of fancy footwork, and then you end up with a countless multitude of interpretations. It's like a turnstile. That's one of the reasons I'm a pre-tribulationist, and I believe the rapture will come before the tribulation. In 15, none of the New Testament passages on the tribulation mention the church. None. And I could quote several. None of the New Testament passages on the tribulation mention the church. If the church is in the tribulation, why isn't it mentioned? Another thing, if the churches go through the tribulation, why isn't there more teaching or preparation on, okay, guys, you're going through the tribulation, say it in black and white, here's what you got to do. It doesn't exist. Why? Because the church isn't there. We're gone. We're in heaven with Jesus. In 16, the Holy Spirit as a restrainer must be taken out of the world before the lawless one, the Antichrist, who dominates the tribulation period, can be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6-8. And Paul says, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So when the Lord Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation period, he will destroy him, bind him uh, for a period of time. He'll be loosed. We won't get into that. That's in the millennial kingdom. And then uh, thrown into the uh, Hades, the bottomless pit. Um, and that's in Second Thessalonians 2, 6, and 8. Here's a little overview that Ali's going to put up for us of the end times. And it says, uh, it talks about two things that I'll talk about uh, next week the judgment seat of Christ, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those things have to take place. There has to be a time interval for those things to take place, and I will explain what they are next week. But those two events we take uh, part in, and they'll be joyous events that we take part in heaven during the tribulation period. During that seven-year period, we're in heaven, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that next week. 17, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10, all believers of this age must appear before the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. Uh, an event never mentioned in detail accounts connected with the second coming of Christ to the earth. Again, uh, the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, is um, in, in Greek, uh, in the Olympics, they, they had that where they'd give out rewards. And that, that's the idea here. Uh, it, we're never judged again for sin. Again, memorize uh, Romans 8.1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. It has to do with rewards for faithfulness, for serving Christ. And that's what it is concerned with. 18. The coming of Christ for his bride must take place before the second coming to earth for the wedding feast. Um, and that's very important, Revelation 19, 7 to 10. Uh, we're going to have uh, one womp and big banquet with the Lord in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's, it's going to be absolutely awesome. In 19, the 24 elders of Revelation 4, 1 and 5, in verse 14, are representatives of the church 
Many expositors believe this, and it would necessitate that the rapture and reward the, the church before um, the tribulation. So for that to take place in a progressive historical manner, it has to take place by a pre-tribulational rapture. Um, and number 20, listen, folks, it would be easier for me to be from some of these other positions. I won't get into them to just say there's a not, nothing happens. There, there's just a final end to history. Uh, there's one big event at the end and there's judgments all mixed in together and a whole bunch of things. And the Lord uh, comes down. Uh, from heaven and then at the same moment people go up and then they, they come down and they return to earth and it's just one big thing and it would be a lot simpler and it's simpler to understand but it doesn't make sense when you read your bible when you look at passages you've got to figure out okay th this seems to indicate this but if i really believe that this doesn't make sense and that's the way the bible speaks to me I've taken the most difficult journey and the most complex journey because I believe it's biblical. And that's what I share with you, what I believe to be biblical. And yes, it does get confusing. Yes, it does get a bit complicated, et cetera, et cetera. But don't worry about that. Just hang on to the truth that Christ is coming before the tribulation, that everybody, everybody, will be included and he'll take us up to be with him then take us home to heaven uh, until the end of uh, the tribulation period when christ returns to earth to set up his millennial reign his kingdom i thought uh in closing this morning i i'd read this thing that i found again it was it's uh kind of sad in a way, but um, it just strikes home um, kind of the reality of life for, for all of us. And uh, obviously, if it's true, um, this person ran into a, a medical profession, which I hold them in the highest regard. But unfortunately, this, this person uh, had a dealing with somebody who did not have a very um, uh, empathetic bedside manner. The English poet Alexander Pope wrote, Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. But where does a man turn when his hope dries up? The director of a medical clinic told a terminally ill young man who came in for his usual treatment. He was a new doctor who was on duty and said to him casually and cruelly, and I emphasize cruelly, you know, don't you, that you won't live out the year. As the young man left, he stopped by the director's desk and he wept. That man took away my hope, he blurted out. I guess he did, replied the director. Maybe it's time you find a new one. Commenting on this incident, and, and I love that Lewis Smeads, the late Lewis Smeads wrote, is there a hope when hope is taken away? Is there a hope when hope is taken away? Is there a hope when the situation is hopeless? That question leads us to Christian hope. For in the Bible, hope, listen to these words, is no longer a passion for the possible. It becomes a passion for the promise. It becomes a passion for the promise. So we have this promise to hold on to that will one day become reality in our lives, every single one of us. This thing that Titus calls the blessed hope, the rapture of the church. And we have that promise this morning, and I want to end on this note, and you can hang on to that on the good days and the not so good days, my fellow Christian. Hang on to that hope. Let it anchor your life and your soul. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can look at these constructive things to help us and encourage us. And Father, above all, 
above all instill in us hope. That assurance based on your person and your work and your word that you will bring to completion all that you have promised for us. And that completion will come through the blessed hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, that blessed hope for the church, the rapture, his catching away of the church. So God, be with us this day. Again, encourage hearts, the people I've prayed for. Please encourage and bless them. And please be with little Luke, I ask, in a special way. For we ask these things in your precious name. Amen.